And my name is Mena Sahi and I'm from the full-time 2010 program. I moved to London about two and a half years ago, though it feels less than that because I spent one year of that lo lockdown, you know, in, in my apartment. Uh, so don't feel like I've been in London long enough, but I moved here two and a half years ago uh, and immediately found my community by joining the club um, committee here. Um, but I was very active prior to that in the India alumni community as well, um, and always a big um, advocate of bringing all our alums together and trying to get to know each other and do work together as well. Um, I'm quite excited about today's session because the person who um, we will be speaking to is a very good friend of mine, Ruchira. Um, Ruchira Chaudhary has recently released a book um, and actually, I have it here. I, have, I should bring it next to the screen so I can show it. Uh, but um, I'll, do it I'll, do it. I'll do the honors for you. Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah, I have a couple of copies lying in, the, in this apartment to send us gifts as well. Uh, she's written a very interesting book on uh, on um, why coaching is an essential leadership trait. But before I get started on the, on the book and uh, talking about Ruchira, um, I just want to acknowledge that Ruchira is joining in from Mumbai and the COVID situation in India is, is really tough right now. Uh, so I really appreciate, Ruchira, you taking the time to talk to us. I have been watching uh, your interviews, your blog posts the last few weeks, and it's really inspiring to see you um, talk about um, your work with so much empathy and actually put it in the context of the current situation that the world is facing. So um, uh, really appreciate you making the time to join us today. Um, before we get started, Ruchira, it'll be good to, you know, just the first question that really comes to my mind is like, maybe the audience would love to know what is your story? Like, what is that story that led you to um, write a book on leadership, but more specifically coaching? And I know your journey has been very interesting and Boot has played a big part in that journey. So it'll be good for the audience to know about that. So yeah, over to you. And uh, firstly, thank you very much. It is um, a pleasure as always, a real delight to be doing anything which is connected to Chicago Boots. So thank you for hosting me. Um, and uh, it is in so many ways, as you rightly said, a pleasure also because the coaching journey and the writing journey um, is very closely connected to Chicago Boots. So I would love to tell you, but I, it's a very long winded story. So I'm trying hard to focus on the parts uh, before. I don't want people to be falling asleep. I know it's windy and stormy outside in London right now. And a lot of you have your uh, cups of tea very close to you. So I'll try and make it brief. Um, uh, the stories, let's, let's talk about 2000, 2013 or thereabouts. Um, I had just finished the mid-career MBA from uh, Chicago Booth. I, I went to the executive program, AXP as we call it in Singapore. And I had just recently joined this um, large financial services organization. And I think uh, in my mind, I thought, with all these newfound skills, um, I had taken my capability to the next notch and I would in some ways change the corporate world. Uh, the reality was rather different. You know, I had a background in consulting. I did a lot of work in the human capital strategy space, which was essentially organization design. I've done some very high profile m and integration projects, et cetera. Now, uh, Post booth, this was my first full-time gig after many years. I'd been consulting um, with this firm in, in the Middle East and North Africa. So very quickly, uh, in about a year of being there, I realized this wasn't working out. Not only was the work culture very toxic, I also found a complete vacuum of any kind of enablement or coaching uh, in the organization. Um, it was hard work. And at that juncture, I received a phone call uh, that sort of changed in many ways my life's direction. Uh, from a gentleman called Arnie or Arnold Longboy. If he said he would join in. I don't know if he has, but if he has, I think this, was, this would be a forum to acknowledge him and to say that, thank you for changing my leadership narrative. Arnie used to look after the executive program uh, for Chicago Booth for the UK as well as the uh, newly minted Asia uh, program. And they were looking for an executive coach. Now I should say very candidly, I was certified in a bunch of these, uh, what we call psychometric instruments, but I never envisioned myself as a coach. Remember, I, like a lot of you, went to Chicago Booth 
we pride ourselves on being very numerate, very analytical. And like many people, it evoked images of something which was very amorphous and very fuzzy and really not tangible. But when he sort of, uh, you know, put forward that proposal to come back to Booth and perhaps be that coach, given that I had a background in human capital strategy and that I was certified, it was, a, it was that moment when I said, could I actually do this? And uh, I, I thought about it and, and it actually gave me that ability to walk away from that organization. Uh, a very toxic work culture. I didn't want to wake up in the mornings and go to work. It was a very turbulent time in my career. And it was, I decided to do this at Booth. Um, I became the executive coach for the ADP program, which is essentially targeted at C-level uh, executives. And I suppose I would have done something right. And I stayed on for many years doing that through the ADP pro years. Uh, and uh, thanks to Arnie, I also um, started to teach a class, which was called the leader as coach. And again, one of the profs was meant to be in Singapore. He couldn't make it. I think he had visa challenges. So thanks to him, uh, I got those four hours to do that class, which I pretty much put together. And that in many ways, as they say, the rest is history. Singapore is a little village and people find out about you. And when they do, everybody else wants to have a slice of you. So I started replicating this model at Singapore Management University, at NUS, at other business schools in Singapore. And so therein started what started as an experiment of sorts with Booth, the coaching piece, then became something um, I, I started doing a, a lot more along with my other consulting work. And in essence, I realized all those sort of um, ideas I had about it being amorphous and fluid, uh, when I got really close to it, I realized what I was doing was truly helping leaders untangle the knots in their head. And having been to the same business school, I was in a much better position to assimilate classroom learnings with their personal trials and tribulations. And so I think that was a very rich experience for me, a very fulfilling experience for me to be able to untangle those knots and to really realize that I had a part to play in making someone go higher, in making somebody become a better version of themselves. So that's the coaching story. Um, spent 14 years in Singapore and um, three years ago, my spouse had to moved to India, um, good, bad, ugly, I don't know, but we were here and I struggled for the first six months to try and find my feet. But I got the opportunity to write a column for a well-respected uh, business magazine, uh, a paper actually. And I wrote a column for them called The Coaching Conundrum. And when I did that, um, it got the eye of uh, the Penguin editors and they said, you know what, we think it's a white space in the market. Would you like to convert it into a book? So the book happened. The book has a lot of Chicago boots. So if you have a chance to read it, I think you'll relate to a lot of things I've said in it. Thanks, Ruchira. Um, while you say you took six months to find your feet, there is uh, not a single person I know in India that doesn't know you. You're very networked. <laughs> and, uh, your, your name has gone around really fast. Uh, I'm with a lot of credibility. So uh, that's great. As a, it, and it's associated with, with Booth because every time I tell someone I am from Chicago Booth, they'll be like, oh, do you know Ruchira? So, <laughs> right. um, you know, so that's, uh, that's great. But I think it takes a lot of courage to internalize that um, a work environment is toxic and actually then to walk away from that and I'll hold that thought I have a follow-on question on that uh, but before we go to that question I just so that fundamentally you know, we all um, we all get the same understanding maybe you can help us understand a little bit about what's the difference between coaching mentoring and being a sponsor because all of us who are in senior roles are managing people are at some stage in our careers doing one of these but what is the difference and how do you want to consistently be a better coach uh, and differentiate yourself from being a mentor and sponsor? And then before just handing it back to you, for those who just joined, feel free to put your cameras on. Um, next to your names, you can also put the year that you graduated from Chicago Boots so that everyone knows each other. And uh, if you have any questions, do start putting them in the chat box. So I'll make sure we, we get to ask them. Over to you, Richard. Yeah. Okay, fantastic question. Uh, let me just show you the book cover again, right? Um, then we'll start. I gave um, my publishers a very, very hard time. I have to be honest. I mean, I'm high maintenance, but this one I think took the cake. So visually, as you can see it, this is a spaghetti or a knot and that knot untangles, entangles. And that's where they would keep stopping. And my brief was very simple. Uh, 
a psychotherapist can do that for you. Yeah, a psychiatrist can do that for you. Take away the white noise. The role of coaching, very simply, is to help untangle, but also to help you go higher and to make you shine brighter. And the way you do that through coaching is through a series of self-enabling and non-directive conversa non conversations, which essentially help the individual become a better version of himself or herself. It's about maximizing potential and performance. And that's what we're seeing throughout in the narrative, in the book, in all the conversations I've had. Now, this whole uh, sort of definition of how it's different from mentoring, we'll come to the sponsor a bit later. Uh, we use mentoring and coaching rather interchangeably. I've, I've been doing it, everybody's been doing it, but at the core of it, there is a very intrinsic, a very basic difference. Think about a mentor as somebody who's um, typically older, uh, yields a lot of influence, but the key is mentors dispense their wisdom. They've been there, they've done it. Um, they give you a lot of counsel, right? They guide the practice of your life career-wise or otherwise. And they can come from anywhere. They could be your colleagues, typically older colleagues. Um, they could be an ex-client, an ex-boss. They could even be a family friend. But it's somebody who's telling you, guiding you, so that you can then, in many ways, replicate the model that made them successful. Now, coaching, by contrast, in terms of what I explained, is about somebody helping you here and now, taking your skills and your capability a notch higher. So your coach essentially is guiding your current practice, whereas a mentor is guiding your journey, your career journey or your life journey. So think about the coach as someone who's there where all the action is, observing, giving you real-time feedback. And a mentor is typically watching it from the sidelines, from the balcony as we call it, right? So they're observing, but they're not giving you real-time feedback. And that's the difference. So one, the coach will ask you the right questions so you can come up with the answers, a mentor, will tell you the answers. And that's really, in essence, what a mentor and a coach does. And I encourage everybody to have both, by the way. Uh, these are not mutually exclusive. Sponsorship is, I would say, fairly recent terminology. We started using it only in the last few years. And sponsor, a sponsor is an individual who goes that extra mile, who could be your mentor, but apart, it's not just about telling or guiding or advising. This sponsor actually sticks his or her neck out. This individual will pick up the phone and open doors for you. We'll say, hey, I think Ruchira is fantastic at m &A. Uh, Do you think we could get her the next assignment? Or uh, this individual could say that, you know, um, we, 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 need, um, we need new faculty members and we need somebody who can teach leadership, but I know somebody. So this individual, is not, will not simply tell you what to do, will not simply uh, give you counsel. And frankly, we, we end up getting a lot of people who help us with that. Bit. It's really about going the extra mile, it's sticking your neck out, it's investing in you, right? So think about coaches, coaches help, um, mentors guide or tell, and sponsors invest in you. Does that help? Yeah, I think that really helps. And I think it's important to know that because what we what your book is all about is about how to build, how to how to think more like a coach leader rather than a mentor leader or just a sponsor. That means helping your teams and helping your people actually self internalize their potential and then drive towards it. But how do then you get to that and how do you how do you um uh, build that skill set and that trait in yourself to, to be that coach leader. But, you know, we are living through very unprecedented times. And um, for a lack of word, we are living through a crisis, you know, and uh, uh, it's so much more right now in India when we think about it. Does the role of a coach leader change in times like this? Uh, and if so, how? And then if someone's a coach leader, what could they really achieve or deliver in times like this that like somebody who's not a coach leader will not be able to achieve? See, um, I think it's a great question, but I also think it's very layered. So <laughs> there's no simple answer to it. There are good coaches uh, and they are abysmal coaches. And let's face it, the research tells us that most managers fall short of being good coaches. And that's not me telling you, that's a lot of research. It's Satya Nadella expressing disappointment when he walked into a broken Microsoft and realized that 
literally less than 5% of the leadership team spend time on conversations. Study after study in HBR tells you that managers or leaders think they're coaching when they pretty much are just telling people what to do. They block that 30 minutes in the calendar and they dispense all that wisdom. And in many ways, it's about creating mini me's. This is what made me successful in the past. This is how you would do it. And that, as I said earlier, goes against the very grain of coaching. Coaching is all about asking, not telling. It's about surrendering that degree of control. It's about giving more power to the question than the answer, right? So that's coaching. And even under, even under regular normal circumstances, most managers fall short as coaches. But frankly, times like this, uh, when we're in a crisis of mammoth proportions, right? Um, more than ever, we need our leaders, our managers to step up and be those coaches and enablers. And I'll, I'll sort of unpack that thought. We're living in very uh, complex times, right? Um, our organizations are very wired, connected. It's a very complicated ecosystem. And now we have this pandemic. And um, the difference between a complicated problem <clears throat> is that a complicated problem has a solution. It has best practices. You've been there, you've done that. Experts tell you. In a complex situation, or a super complex situation, I don't know if there's a good word for it, that like we are facing, no leader can have all the answers, right? There's, not, there's nothing linear about it. We don't know if we do A, will that lead to B or C? So it's all trial and error. Now, in a situation like this, you cannot be that leader who has all the answers. You can't be, you can't be uh, using a command and control style or you can't be using instruction. So you have to move from the instruction piece to the motivation piece. You need to leverage the collective intelligence of your people. And by that, what I mean is you need to surround yourself with people who know a lot more than you do, or at least experts. You need to start giving your people a voice and the good ideas can come from anywhere. The businesses that have managed not just to survive, but thrive during the pandemic, who've completely pivoted their business models or changed these business models overnight are those that gave a voice to everybody that gave people a platform for their suggestions and ideas, right? So that's one. The other is these, these waters are very, very choppy, right? You need a leader with a very steady hand at the helm. And you need to think about, if, you know, you need to think about a few things. So trust, resilience, these have to be your rudders. Trust, building the, your reservoirs of trust has never been more important, right? Uh, again, a very recent study tells us more than 40% of employees feel that their bosses don't trust them. They're constantly checking in on them or checking on them. Uh, you know, your personal and your professional worlds are now constantly polite. You, this is this whole thing about always being on. And as a leader, more than ever, you truly need to think about empathy. You need to think about understanding the reality of your people understanding that you need to check in on them periodically, but trust them to do their job. Don't keep checking on them. You need to cut them slack without letting them slack off. You need to appreciate that everybody's reality is different. Some of us uh, have patchy internet connections and we live in smaller spaces, or we have young children barking dogs. You can't put everybody in the same boat because we are all in the same raging storm, but we're not in the same boat. And that's what it takes a good leader to truly assimilate. And I guess the last bit, I, and I think it's important to say that is, you need to be a resilient leader. You need to take, take people along. You need to ensure that they don't nose dive into the valley of despair. We have to come out of adversity. We have to have optimism, even if it's bo bounded optimism, which is real, be realistic, yet be optimistic about the future. Take them along with you. And yes, I should, I keep adding things to it. I think be role models. Your, your, your people are looking at you for cues. Don't be stressed and helpless all the time. And give them the right signals. When um, a Jane Fraser at Citibank says, we won't do Zoom calls on a Friday, that's a fantastic signal. That gives you the right signal and you need role models like that. So be, be that individual, be that leader who simply you know, um, takes people along in the journey and more than anything and more than any other time we need it now. 
Thanks, Richard. I mean, you, you mentioned really some very interesting points there, and most of them allude towards having, um, you know, more empathy, more compassion, some of the, the most softer skills of um, checking in, uh, showing emotion <laughs> at these times, uh, being authentic, actually, I, you know, if, you know, if you're telling your employees that look, it's okay to not feel okay, and then you yourself don't express it, then um, uh, you know, it's, it, it doesn't really serve the purpose. And so, you know, you also alluded to the fact that you worked in a previously toxic environment, and you re recognized it, and you walked away. I mean, a lot of us over here work in very hard nosed, aggressive, competitive cultures. Uh, that can at times get toxic or get um, get over um, get underappreciate soft skills. Um, yeah. And coaching requires you to to actually exhibit a lot more soft skills. So, what is how do coaches fit in cultures like this where soft skills are not appreciated? And what what should they do about it? You know, it's a uh, uh, it's um, you know, you could, it, it's pretty energy consuming when you bring your empathy, your compassion, your whole self to work. Uh, but if that environment doesn't appreciate that and you know that the right thing is to coach your team, you, you know the right thing is to support your team, but the, the culture is different. How, how do you work in that environment? I know that's not an easy question, uh, but I'm hoping to get some easy tricks uh, to take back to work. Well, a couple of things. For starters, um, you know, what we call soft skills uh, end up being the hardest things. And uh, a lot of you, I, I don't know what life stage you are in, but you'll appreciate uh, 15, 20 years down the line when everybody's in leadership positions after having graduated from business schools, uh, you do a CEO survey or a, a senior leadership survey and they'll say the hardest skills are what we perceive to be the softer skills. In fact, uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, sort of new age research tells us that we at business schools don't really prepare our people um, to take on the real world because we learn a lot about uh, strategy and finance and you know corporate finance but we truly omit what we think are the softer skills as optionals or electives and that has to change because the fact of the matter is that is the hardest bit to navigate uh, enough and more uh, business schools are now rejigging their uh, curriculums to see how they can include that and um, make people a lot better prepared as they take on these uh, soft skill, hard challenges, I suppose. So to your point about being in cultures where coaching is not um, welcome or is perceived to be soft and emotional, um, I guess my only advice is you get good coaches everywhere, right? You And these coaches are people who, whose only interest is in helping you become a better version of yourself, helping you soar higher and do better. Now, if you're somebody who believes in it, but feels trapped in a culture that doesn't appreciate it, I would simply recommend that you um, perhaps understand the cultural nuances a little bit better and mold your coaching style, right? So at the very outset, I do want to say that coaching is not just warm and fuzzy and soft and nurturing. It comes in many ways. There's a lot of tough love coaching as well, right? We've seen... We have enough and more examples from history where some of the most successful leaders have been very relentless in their pursuit of excellence. They say that even a mild-mannered Tim Cook can be quite a tough cookie when he wants to be. But the difference is a lot of these people, no matter how tough they are, their exterior, all that they do comes from a place of love. And they are pretty candid in admitting that the only thing they want is for the individual to rise higher. So I would encourage any manager who is in a culture which is seen to be more command and control style, more instruction than motivation, um, perhaps customize your style of coaching. Remember, coaching isn't just about blocking 30 minutes in the calendar. It's not just structured conversations. Coaching comes in many shapes and forms. Coaching happens in the moment. It happens informally and formally. It happens in conference rooms, but it also happens in... Um, you know, car parks, it happens in the moment when you give somebody real-time feedback. Coaching happens when you shine the light on somebody in your team. Coaching happens when you say, hey, the global head is in town, let me introduce him or her, you know, to somebody who works with me. So 
you could still go ahead and be that coach. And if you are in a position of influence, I would say try and change the culture to the extent that you can. These are baby steps. It won't happen tomorrow. And remember, in these cultures, just as you will feel uncomfortable coaching, you will find that the coaches will not want to be coached because they are so used to a manager giving them answers. Remember, that's how we were taught at business school. Good managers always have the answers. So if you suddenly start asking somebody a bunch of questions, he or she is not going to be okay with it. It's very uncomfortable, right? Because we've always been told what to do. Now, suddenly you're asking me a whole bunch of questions. So I guess long-winded answer to your question. Assimilate the cultural nuances of the organization. Be that coach. But you can tweak your coaching style to suit the culture of the organization and, and, and ensure that in your own way, you can also try and bring it that, that change where enablement and lifting and building others uh, can be followed. If you can still pursue the numbers while building your people. Thanks, Ruchira. Um, for those who are just joining, feel free to put your cameras on uh, next to your names. Feel free to put the year that you graduated from Chicago Booth. And uh, if you have questions, uh, just put them on chat and uh, uh, we'll ask them or just put saying, I have a question. So then when I open it up to audience questions, I'll just call on you and then you can ask that question. Um, uh, Rujira, I'm glad you didn't say that, well, if the culture doesn't appreciate soft skills, then leave and find an organization that... Uh, I mean, you can leave, of course. <laughs> Nobody stops you, but <laughs> I'd say yeah. don't leave. Now, but, there's one thing, actually, I forgot to mention to you. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I learned was these culture in these cultures, we don't ask for coaching because we're not used to it. So exactly. perhaps one another way of doing it is actually ask your boss for some coaching. See what you yeah. See what works. Yeah. So actually, that's exactly what I was leading to, which is you can you can lead from the front, which is you yourself. It doesn't matter which stage in your career you are, how senior or junior you are, yeah. you everyone benefits from coaching. Uh, and so kind of lead from the front and actually ask for that. But what if your boss or the person you're directly reporting into is not a good coach? They just weren't built to be that right coach. They're very like authoritative and directive. Um, what what do you do in such so firstly i think there is a consequence of that on your career because a lot of people do not realize and i think when i read your book it kind of made me realize that if you don't have a boss who's a good coach you sometimes don't internalize the potential you could be achieving towards so firstly i would love to understand from you that when you don't have a boss what is the consequence of that to your career and second when you don't have a boss who's a good coach how do you build that support system for yourself well you have uh, a crappy boss, as you're saying, but you like the organization and you, <laughs> I'm not suggesting you have to leave the organization. Um, firstly, perhaps you've never had a conversation with the individual. So maybe it's worthwhile seeking that coaching because um, the boss doesn't know what he doesn't know, right? Uh, it's not something that is done in the culture. Uh, you know, this, this thin line between appraising, managing and building others. Uh, most most managers will not coach because they think it's their jo job to appraise you and give you your final compensation or at least play, play a part in it at the end of the year. And uh, hence they think building you or helping you is not part of you know, their job description. And it's something that HR should be doing or external coaches should be doing. So as I said earlier, first try seeking it. And if it completely eludes you or you have this, as you said, hard-nosed boss who's very cut and dry, if you're not getting it from your boss, then find somebody in the ecosystem who can support you, uh, who understands who you are, what the work that you do, um, and that could come from a peer. So peer coaching can be fantastic as well. Ideally, somebody you trust, obviously. And it could be your boss's boss, uh, if you feel you have a relationship. Um, you have to find somebody within that ecosystem. If you go outside that ecosystem, the individual is not in a position to appreciate or give you real-time feedback or observations on how you're doing to help you to help ask the right questions that will lead to the right answers. So find somebody in your ecosystem. And I'm sure if you look hard enough, you'll get somebody. Uh, but do try speaking to your boss first. Thanks. I have one last question and then I'll open it up to the audience. So as um, as people read the book, so, you know, in case if you haven't bought it, it's on Amazon in the UK now. It's called 
coaching the secret code to uncommon leadership. Um, but as as people in the boot community actually read this book, what are the five main things you feel that they should definitely try to take away from the book? I don't know the five or more. I haven't counted, but I, I'll try not to go. I will try and limit you to five. What are the five? Okay, just, just don't put the spotlight on me because then I keep looking at my face and I don't know where to stop, right? So if you're there, you can signal and say that, I'm, you know, I'm just speaking too much. Okay. First things first. First, please understand what coaching is, right? And coaching is a series of self-enabling, non-directive conversations, which help maximize the potential and of the potential and performance of the individual. And the, and the sort of uh, keywords here are self-enabling and non-directive, right? And I said earlier, it's about asking, it's not about telling. A lot of us confuse coaching with telling others what to do. We confuse coaching with listening to the sound of our own voice. Coaching is about active listening. A skill I like, I have to be candid, it's, to, it's been years of hard work to get there. And one of the things that, um, we all have this sort of temptation to give solutions very quickly. That's how we've been taught, how we've been brought up in business schools. We need to know the answers. And you know, early days in a coaching session, uh, my first reaction was, oh, this is not going anywhere. How should I help this person? You have to contain that urge to offer solutions. The solution is not yours. The, the individual will find the solution. You have to help facilitate the path to getting there. So, First, truly assimilate what coaching is and also recognize that it can come in many shapes and forms. It comes not through just a 30, 40 minute conversation and it's definitely not your performance appraisal. It's, it's really about the you know, real-time feedback, conversation, a pat on the back, um, giving somebody specific examples of how she or he performed, shining the light on others. And please be cognizant that when you shine the light on others, you truly shine brighter. When you elevate people, you go higher. And that's the premise of coaching. The second piece is you also have to be cognizant what is coaching really doing for the individual? So how do you coach? And so I have a framework um, as a good semi-academic of sorts. I think everybody needs to put a framework. That's what Professor Michael Gibbs told me when he saw the first draft of my book. He said, it's a great book, but you don't have a framework. So you know, I went back and put this framework. It's called the 4C plus model, which basically says what what kind of coaching outcomes should somebody expect? And the first C uh, is really giving the individual clarity. It's back to you know untangling those knots, kicking away the noise. And in some ways you help make, transform those knots into patterns, right? The answer lies within, but as a coach, you help, help really untangle those knots. The second piece is consciousness, which is what we refer to as self-awareness. We all have our blind spots, and a coach will help you get there. The third piece is um, confidence. Uh, a lot of us truly lack that. We need that push to go the extra mile. And it's the confidence that spurs action. It's a self-belief to go forward. And the last bit is capability, right? Which is uh, everything around being more creative, innovative, perhaps inventing your own career ladder. That's what a coach does for you. And that gets fueled by an organizational culture. That's the last thing. But be aware of what you do as a coach. Give people clarity. Make them more conscious or self-aware. Uh, give them more confidence. And really make them more people. And I guess, I don't know if it was the last bit or the third point or seventh point, but these are trying times. We're in the throes of the worst pandemic ever. Please step up. Be more em empathetic. Trust your people more. Be more resilient. And be those role models. Thanks, Richard. I'll open it up to questions. Uh, I think, uh, Lydia, do you have a question? Would you like to introduce yourself and then ask your question? Okay. Hi, hi, I'm Lydia. Yes, I'm just um, trying I'm to find a way to unmute myself. So, uh, yeah, my question is um, just uh, some very simple and direct. Uh, what are some questions that like, a coach should always ask when they start with uh, you know, the, the one they're coaching? And also, some of are there any questions that you can think of that are commonly asked but really should be avoided? Okay, so, um, you know, they say the whole um, the premise of coaching is that you don't ask closed questions, right? You ask open-ended questions, right? Um, and there isn't a specific sort of order of questions, but do think about the current context. Coaching isn't um, done in a vacuum, right? 
So if Lydia has done a fantastic presentation to let's say the investors, my role as a boss or a manager would be, I mean, if I feel that you could have done better or there were parts of the presentation that perhaps needed more work, my role as a coach would be to make you aware without giving you that negative feedback. So coaching could pose something like, so Lydia, how do you think the presentation went? Okay. Were you happy with parts of it or could we have done something better? I, I'm just making this up, but what I'm saying is we don't do coaching in a vacuum. It has to be contextual. It could be something that happened recently with a client. It could be something that you did as part of, uh, you know, your current uh, work practice. So think about uh, coaching in the current context. And there's a model that a lot of coaches use. It's a very basic model. It's called the GROW model, right? It's called uh, GROW. G stands for the goal. So what is our goal today? R is what is your reality? O is uh, perhaps all the obstacles that you will have to look at. And the W stands for the way forward. And if you Google it, there's a, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of hit, hits on uh, giving you examples and samples of these questions. We call them the uh, Socrates type of questions, which are open-ended. So you're, you, you, you don't lead people to the answer, you help them. You help them understand for themselves that they could have done something differently. And, uh, and then you lead them to that bit, but without actually uh, sort of saying, hey, I think, uh, I think the presentation didn't go as, as well as it did the last time. You'll come to the realization yourself. That's what the coach is helping you do. Thanks. Thanks, Lydia. Thanks, Ruchira. Um, One of our colleagues on the call has recommended sharing his coaching experience. But before I open up to that, and I'm sure a lot of people here have some very interesting experiences of being coaches or being coached. Uh, and I think we can spend the last 10 minutes discussing that. Any more questions from anybody else um, to ask Ruchira, either about the topic or just about her book or anything else? Yeah, go ahead, um, Heather. Take your bones first on the chat. Uh, Mayna, you can come back to me, no problem. Okay, go ahead. Um. Um, so, you know, the book has been really well received, right? And you've been working with these C-level people prior to publishing the book and helping them untangle. Like, my experience of corporates is so, I can't actually believe that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> for me like coaching is I've had to get a coach you know and it's always something I have to get extra yeah. and it's not within the forms but is so have we just ended up in a real mess and in terms of corporate culture and how I don't know what I'm trying to ask you but I, I'm just I'm really I, I feel this is a really positive step but I'm I kind of can't believe it's working because <laughs> of my experience of corporate uh, <laughs> Yvonne uh, firstly you have the book and I know you do so you have to read the last chapter you haven't gotten there yet. No. Right. Uh, yeah, I know you haven't gotten there yet, but that'll help. But having said that, um, it's very easy to get disillusioned, right? Because uh, our own experience colors what we believe, we feel about uh, being in the corporate world. And believe me, I was pretty much uh, in the same boat when I was uh, exiting this financial services firm. It was a complete vacuum of any kind of enablement. And in fact, I remember I'd uh, made this presentation. I was called in on a board meeting with my boss. And the Asia Pacific CEO actually yelled at me uh, across the corridor uh, with a lot of people in the audience. And that sort of shakes you up, right? It completely shakes your confidence. And you thought you were cat's whispers, right? Um, and you were consulting with CEOs and this, this was this new gig after you'd come out of booths, you changed the world. And then you have this man who's screaming at you uh, with a pretty um, high profile audience to boot. Um, so I think my, my answer is, that's going to be the same. There are cultures that fuel coaching and the cultures that don't. They're very debilitating for individuals. You need to find an organization that works for you. If you truly are in a, you have time and again, not um, had the privilege or the pleasure of having some great coaches. And I should add that these coaches can come in many forms, right? They should be your bosses but they could also be clients. They could also be people that uh, have helped you along your journey. I've had a couple of um, profs at Booth who've been great coaches. I would say more mentors than coaches because they've been guiding me as opposed to helping me with my current practice. But you have to embrace and find the individual. My clients have morphed into good coaches because 
while I was not, um, you know, I was not reporting to them fully in that sense, but they saw the work that I was doing. So they were in a position to give me real-time feedback. So think hard and say, who is it that would be the best equipped to give me uh, feedback, but also ask me the right questions? And that's some kind of soul searching you need to do. And yes, by all means, go and get an executive coach for yourself if you feel that your organization has a complete vacuum. But honestly, Yvonne, if every organization that you've been to has just had crappy bosses, maybe it's time to think about a different organization. Is there a pattern in there or have you asked for coaching? You just need to think through that because, you know, we dif uh, different organizations will have different cultures, but there are people in there and people really, the tone and tenor is set by the leadership team. So you have to think hard about where you want to be. Yeah, I mean, Richie, you're just following up on that. It's often very difficult to read the tone and tenor from outside when you're evaluating yes. the organization to join. It's only once you're inside that you really realize whether there is, um, you know, that culture in which you can actually thrive, you know. Um, are there any, like, signs to look out for to, to say, that? look, you know, like, especially during the interview process, to look out for that, give you a sense that, you know, maybe this organization doesn't have that culture to invest in people's growth. Ask the right questions. Um, ask how people are promoted. Uh, ask what you look for, uh, what they look for when they hire you. And so actually it's a good question because it's not enough to be giving people coaching skills across the board. And it's really not enough to be saying, oh, coaching is this fantastic new thing that will change us. Ask the right questions. Um, you know, a lot of us at Booth, if you remember it, we learned about the arc in an organization. I don't know, it's a strategy model. The architecture, the routines, and the culture of an organization. And the arc stands for all the formal or the informal systems, which is essentially um, the organization design. How hierarchical is it? Uh, is it a matrix organization? Do we do a lot more project work? Ask the right questions because that will give you an understanding uh, of how bureaucratic the organization is. How does information flow up and down? How do we address each other, right? Um, talk, ask more about how many times a year will you get appraised? Will there be, will there be some structured feedback in coaching sessions or, you know, and, you, and you'll get those answers and you'll get the cues. Ask uh, also about how people are hired because organizations that truly want to enable and build others will go beyond just your experience and what you've done, but also will hire for skills and aptitude. So they gauge if you have it in you to be a good leader, which is, can you take others along in the journey? Uh, when they promote you, are they checking for the right things? As in, are they really worried about how many people you coached and mentored? Uh, and if so, that's a positive sign. But if you see, if there are red flags in all of those, right? It's a problem. And you're absolutely right, you can't tell. Um, the other piece is culture. Um, do they celebrate people? who coach and build others? Do we, do we sort of become those role models like a Satya Nadella? Hard to gauge from the outside, but do your research before an interview. Find out more about the organization. Find out not just about the compensation through Glassdoor, but find out more. Talk to people who've been in these organizations. And frankly, getting a good or a bad boss is sometimes luck. But if we consciously try and work with, with organizations where we know that there is a culture of building and enabling that will stand us in good stead. That's great. Heather, I think you had a question and then I'll open it up to everyone sharing to share experiences of coaching. After. Yeah. Thanks, Nina. Um, and, and actually, it's not dissimilar to the um, uh, to the comments that have that have that have gone before around sort of finding that good coach. Um, do you have any tips for maybe closing down or, or getting out of a coaching relationship that isn't working for you, where you're being, maybe the person coaching you is just absolutely not right for you. You really want to finish that, move on, but maybe it's somebody from within the company and that would be a little bit tricky. Um, have you come across that? And how would you kind of yeah, like, be I mean, that? The whole, whole premise of a coaching relationship is your chemistry. And when you feel the individual's adding value, and if you feel you're not learning anything new or it's not taking, um, your skills or your capability to the next level, you absolutely should cut it off. Um, I guess just be a good diplomat and say that 
it's been fantastic, but I know I've taken up a lot of your time. And, uh, you know, I've really focused on building whatever, X, Y, Z, my, my game theory or whatever. Uh, I'd really want to learn more about marketing. So I was thinking maybe I would approach X, Y, Z. Just be nice, uh, be grateful, be thankful for all the time the individual is devoted to you, but just graciously cut it off. I mean, the longer you stay in a relationship, uh, it's going to hurt you. It's just going to uh, get to a stage where you're really not growing and learning. So for, the, for both your sakes, just end it as nicely as you can. Thank you. And I'm just going to be clear, I'm not in that situation right now. No, it's, just, okay. you know, <laughs> it's one it's of these things space. that you know comes up. It, yeah. It's a safe space by all means. I, I, and I think a lot of you have the same question. If we have bosses that are not great coaches, let's do this in order. Try asking. Sometimes when you don't ask, you don't get. And perhaps the individual doesn't know what he doesn't know or he, she doesn't know. Try. That doesn't work. Look around in the ecosystem. Can somebody else be that coach? Are there people you trust? Are there people who can guide you on your current practice, as I keep calling it? And that can come in the form of a peer. It does not have to be somebody that you report to. It could be somebody who you respect and trust. Uh, it could be your boss's boss, frankly. You know, you know, you can cross that line because this is this is about enabling and, and taking yourself to the next level or just find somebody in a different department or a different function, but find. And if all else fails, get yourself the executive coach. You can get the executive coach anyway. I, I just say the two have to tag team, but I think it's a boss's and a manager's foremost responsibility to build and nurture the next line of leaders. And as you rightly said, uh, and as Yvonne was saying to me, more often than not, that doesn't happen. I mean, all the research is telling us that most managers make abysmally terrible coaches. Thanks, Ujira. I'll open it up to experience sharing. I think some of you all had, I can't remember who put it on the chat, but somebody, somebody mentioned that they wanted to share their experience of uh, being coached or being a coach. So you're just opening it up to everyone to share that. Sure. Yeah, it's, uh, it's my name, Dean. I would like to uh, share my experience about coaching in my company. Let me share my, uh, let me show the video. Um, so um, in my experience, um, I exactly like the present, uh, the author say, <laughs> I couldn't say your name, sorry. Um, uh, so firstly, we need to understand the mentoring and coaching, yeah, so uh, so from my experience, I, in the past, I fall in that trap as well. I tend to do the mentoring bit and offer solution. But later, when I learned how to coaching about two years ago, I found coaching the much, much powerful because all of us, we are individual. It, your solution might work for you, but might not work for your coachee because they are not you. They have different background, different uh, yeah, all sorts of things in their personality. So, as, as so you say, uh, listening and also guide them to come up with their own solution. And then the act of listening is quite powerful because sometimes they come to you, they might not um, tell you the, what their problem, the, the underlying problem, hinder them, <laughs> have the confidence. So it might because something else, yeah. Uh, also, I find uh, when you ask them open-ended question, and yes. then ask them, uh, so like that they realize, ah, right. Maybe lots of time they think they couldn't do so, 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 so and so. It's all in their head. Other people might not might not have the same problem for individual, yeah. So from my experience, I literally, I found amazing. It literally, if, if you do it well, even one session will change the whole thing. <laughs> literally, you don't need three months coaching. You just like one or two, that's it. You, you get the result. But obviously there's lots of different type of coaching in a way. One is particular problem or one's long-term coaching. Yeah. Uh, I'm luck quite luckily, I, I can say my company beginning to recognize uh, as a management because we are IT consultant. So people is our asset. Uh, so the more we um, um, enable our 
workflow get better and then we can do more better work. So we saw that in, it's not going to be easy, but like you say, not all the manager is a good coach. But I found if, if you manage to uh, chain a few of them, and then it like ripple effect. And then suddenly I can see in my own eyes one a really boring manager, like therefore show their feelings suddenly change. <laughs> so that, that's my experience, right? So that's what I would like to share with the group. Uh, Thank you. That was uh, that was very very uh, useful. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, anybody else wants to share the experience of being coached or being a coach? I should say though, before we get another question, is that uh, if we do believe uh, in this whole enablement and coaching piece, I think we should truly make that attempt to be coaches ourselves. I think that's where it starts in many ways. To, we are we are all very keen on seeking coaching, and I think perhaps we can also reflect on our own management styles. How are we building people? Are we enabling them? Are we shining light on them? Are we making them more confident? Are we giving them more clarity? Uh, that I think you can sow the seeds in your own way. Can I agree more? Um, so I'll maybe share one experience I've had. So often I feel like my tendency used to be that when things don't go right or when these knots, as you mentioned, are too complicated, I can't figure them out. That's when I go to a coach. And I yeah. realized in my experiences that every time that happens and I go to the coach, I'm actually looking for a solution. So I'm actually not yeah. really looking for a coach. I'm looking for a mentor, someone who's been through that experience and can tell True. me exactly how to handle it. Uh, I found the flip side of, when things are going well, uh, or I'm working towards specific transitions like a promotion or a change of changes or something like that, that's when I, when I sign up for a coach preemptively to say that, you know, there could be some growth opportunities. I don't know what they are. Let's get a coach and try and work and decide what they are and then work on them. I felt like those are the times when coaching has really helped me. Um, but I do see a lot of friends reaching out since they know I've gone through coaching before that, you know, when it's when, when shit hits the fan is when they're reaching out and saying, hey, I think I need an executive coach. And I'm not sure whether that's the right time, but that's my personal experience uh, with, with, with coaching. Um, I'd say get an executive coach anyway. I mean, if the shit has hit yeah. the ceiling. Well, luckily um, I have you. <laughs> uh, I, I should also add at this juncture, there is absolutely... Um, you should go ahead and seek those mentors, right? Easier to get them, correct? And nobody says you can have one mentor, you can have a board of advisors, a mentor who's an expert in a domain, a mentor who knows your industry, a mentor. So if you can get yourself really, if you can stay connected with these people who in the course of your career and your leadership journey have had an, a lasting influence on you, I encourage you to stay in touch with them. There's nothing harm, there's no harm in the principle of somebody giving you advice that has its place. So it's not to say mentorship is not good, but when organizations try to randomly pair people and say, oh, this one's going to be your mentor, where the onus is on you to seek, you know, some organizations do this with a lot of fanfare and those programs fall flat. That's the kind of mentorship you don't want. You need to find mentors for yourself and see if those mentors can be sponsors for you. And I say that again and again, because it's easy to give advice. See if you uh, can truly nurture people who know you for who you are. They've seen some fantastic work you've done. Uh, Ex-bosses, you know, they usually make good sponsors or even ex-clients because they've seen what fantastic work you've done. And they will not hesitate to recommend you for a new role, you know, a promotion, etc. So keep, keep this board of advisors with mentors, sponsors, and yes, the coach, which is what we're talking about today, the coach should come in the form of your immediate boss. But when that's lacking in the current individual, then find somebody in the ecosystem. And even if, if that fails, get yourself that executive coach. That executive coach incidentally can tag team with your boss, with other people in the ecosystem. These are not mutually exclusive things. But find yourself that board of advisors as you move forward in your career journey. Great, thanks. Lydia, last question to you, and then I think we will, we will um, we close the session. Oh, hi, is that, 
peer mentoring is that what you are asking sorry sorry you had a question okay go ahead yeah yeah okay i i just saw tiwa had a question on the chat but i'll just shut with my question first yeah. anyway <laughs> so um yeah i mean there were time there was long time ago when i was in a, almost like a in university that i was kind of like coaching a, a younger student but yeah. that experience kind of also taught me that you know when you've built once you built a trusted relationship with your coachy and yeah. that person is someone who's really in need of help that can be a very um i say close relationship but at the same time uh, can be a burden to a coach themselves oh, yeah. so in oh, such yeah. situation what's your advice to the coach okay i have to be very honest uh, and i you're not alone in this often when i do uh, coaching i get quite uh, emotionally entangled uh, you know in the right way and it takes a lot of bandwidth so and often times you have as i said earlier the urge to help somebody with an answer but you know you shouldn't because it's their answer to find it's their path that they have to traverse not yours um you have to very clearly make the distinction between being a coach and a crutch right um especially in this scenario where you're coaching somebody younger remember a manager his or her coaching is like a continuum right it doesn't stop as long as the individual works with you you should be uh, making the individual a better version making the person soar higher etc but these bursts of coaching are short and focused eventually you have to make the individual self reliant when we do executive coaching assignments we keep saying that in the end you have to be able to navigate your own career journey we come in for short bursts right but you need to be able to navigate the space yourself um so you need to cut it off eventually the second piece is often um coaching becomes like a cathartic experience people talk a lot about their personal challenges their problems uh, i'm not suggesting it happened to you but i had this uh, gentleman from turkey who kept telling me about his wife and his mistress and a girlfriend and how he was so stressed now that doesn't fall into the realm of i'm just giving you an exaggerated example it's it's a bit of a joke so the fact is you have to know your limits you're not a psychotherapist if someone is depressed if someone's going through anguish in their personal life you really cannot intervene so you need to cut it off at that point you need to make a very clear distinction between how you're helping the person become a better version professionally and steer clear away from personal stuff and also something that sucks up so much of your mind space great so i uh, we've run out of time uh, i know there was one more question on peer mentoring but uh, i'm sure ruchira will be very happy to answer it offline so tiwa you should feel free to reach out to her on linkedin uh, but ruchira thank you so much for taking time uh, for everyone on this call thank you so much for joining her book is available here in the uk now Uh, but of so it's i think uh, available in on kindle as well now so uh, feel free to order it and read it um i also want to take this moment to thank um heather she uh, leads the uk alumni club uh, and i mean if it, if it wasn't for her uh, keeping us together and keeping the community going with some events over zoom uh, we probably wouldn't be seeing each other's faces for i don't know how long so thanks heather for constantly uh, keeping us together and then thanks jenny and penka jenny and penka work with the alumni relations i think everyone here knows them they don't need an introduction uh but you know we all just come on these zoom calls and talk they do all the hard work at the back end to make Indeed. this possible so thank you so much and thanks ruchira thanks so much uh, thank you thank you so much pena jenny penka uh, you guys are stars thank you we just as you, you rightly said we just show up and talk Yeah. Thank you everybody for being here. Appreciate it very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Stay safe everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.